Thank you. James Dobson wrote a, a book several years ago called Children at Risk. And in that book he said this, nothing short of a great civil war or values rages today throughout North America. He said, two sides with vastly differing and incompatible worldviews are locked in a bitter conflict that permeates every level of society. And he's right. It, it literally is a battle. And just to kind of give you an idea of how much of a battle it is, atheist Daniel Dennett, he, he actually gave a, a warning to parents that would teach their children anything other than evolution. Take a look at what he said. Those of us who have freedom of speech will feel free to describe your teachings as the spreading of falsehoods. We'll be back up there. And will attempt to demonstrate this to your children at our earliest opportunity. You've got to at least give him credit for being honest. He, he's letting you know that, hey, we're coming out. And they are. In just about every single textbook. Now, here's the ironic thing. I, I've got a, a bunch of science textbooks on the screen, but it's not just science. At, at this point today, it's in their history books. It's in English books. I, the, the subject that I liked the least in school was math. I'm one of those guys, you know, had to have calculus to get to medical school. I'm done. That's, that's it. But the, the things that I really didn't like the most, you remember word problems? You have two trains leave the station. Hated those trains. Wanted to kind of blow them up. Here's the problem. Those trains have been replaced, and now our kids are reading things like, Lucy lived so many millions of years ago, Neanderthal man lived so many millions of years ago. At what point would their lineages have crossed? I actually had a, a young lady in Jacksonville, Alabama. She came up to me. She said, Dr. Harold, there's, there's evolution in my home economics book. I, thought, I really thought she was kidding. I said, can you bring me your textbook tomorrow night? She did. First page, first chapter of a home ec book. Those of you who travel a lot, go through airports. But the reality is, folks, this right here is killing more of our children. Because they're filled with humanism, atheism, evolution. And remember Jesus said, don't fear those who can kill the body, but rather fear those who can kill the soul. And you need to understand right up front, Textbooks today are literally the backbone of every single one of them is humanism, atheism, and what we're discussing this weekend. Now, if I were to ask you, is there anybody here who thinks that textbooks should be allowed to deliberately lie, to deliberately deceive students for any reason? I, I don't think anybody in here would, would want that. I mean, if you look across the board, state by state, every single state, has got some kind of a, a law in place to make sure that that doesn't happen. For instance, Wisconsin says, criteria for selection of a textbook shall be, notice this, factual accuracy. You look at California, it's got to be current, it's got to be confirmed research. Literally, coast to coast, what we've said is, in our laws, we want our kids to have the most current, the most honest the most up-to-date information. And yet, when you actually get into the classroom, what you realize is that's not what we're giving them. In fact, take a look. This is a 2000 textbook, Biology. It says, evolution is a fact, not a theory. Now, think about that in light of what I just said. 
that states are saying things have to be factually accurate. There is no factual accuracy to that statement right there. Because you can't call it a fact. They say birds arose from non-birds, humans from non-humans. No person who has any understanding of the natural world can deny these facts any more than she or he can deny that the earth is round. So here's what we've found. Basically, over the last 20 years, what we've done is we've effectively pulled God and anything representing deity out of the textbooks and replaced it with a godless theory. Now, there's some of you in here probably thinking, so what? What's the big deal? Who cares? Folks, let me ask you, if we remove God, where do we get our standard for right and wrong? In fact, let me go one step further. What happens to a nation that allows their moral compass to no longer have a true north? Well, I'll share with you. For instance, I, I could give you many, many examples. This is just one of them that kind of jumps out at you. It was a, an article that appeared in the Journal of Medical Ethics several months ago. I, I wouldn't tell you, I honestly did not think I would live long enough to see this one in print. The title of the article is Afterbirth Abortion, Why Should the Baby Live? I, I want you to read with me what these authors are suggesting that we now do. It said, abortion is largely accepted even for reasons that do not have anything to do with the fetus's health. By showing that, number one, fetuses and newborns do not have the same moral status as actual persons. Two, the fact that both are potential persons, that's morally irrelevant. Three, adoption is not always in the best interest of actual people. The authors argue that what we call afterbirth abortion, that is, killing a newborn, should be permissible in all the cases where abortion is, including cases where the newborn is not disabled. In fact, these authors go on to state, merely being a human, it's not in and of itself a reason for ascribing somebody a right to life. Now, here's the thing, folks. You shouldn't be that surprised because for the last decade, what they've been teaching our kids is you're just one more link in the evolutionary chain of life. You're just a... Uh, an animal. And yet, the Bible paints a totally different picture. The Bible says that we were created in the image and likeness of God. What does that mean? What, what does it mean to be created in his image? Does, does that mean that, that God's got hands like mine or, or, or a cute face like mine? I, I think most of you know the Bible says that God is a spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, right? Okay, if that's the case, and it is, what part of Brad was created in the image of God? It's my spirit, my soul. Folks, ultimately what they're doing with this teaching is they're removing the soul of man and they're turning... and an abomination unto him. Notice what they are. A proud look, lying tongue. What's number three? 
hands that shed innocent blood. And right about now, some of you are looking at me saying, oh, Brad, you know, you're, you're just being an alarmist. That, that's not ever going to really happen. Well, consider the fact that we're already training our young people to view children as, instead of a reward from God, a parasitic burden on society. And oh, by the way, Planned Parenthood, they're already producing videos for afterbirth abortion. So I'll ask you the question again. How do we teach morals and characters if you don't have an absolute standard without God? You can't. And so... what I call mentally the, the good old days. And, and you guys know what I'm talking about. You know, you, you think back to maybe what TV shows were on when you were a kid. For some of you, it was Andy Griffith. I can't get too far back beyond that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was going with like the love boat and things like that. But, but folks, if, if all we're doing is we're staying mentally in the past, we're not preparing our kids for the future. Because here's the reality. Most of you in this room who attend a, a church service on Sunday, you've probably heard a prayer like this. Where a, a guy will stand up and he'll say something like, Lord, we, we thank you for allowing us to worship without fear of persecution. You ever heard that? I think that prayer is going to end possibly within the next five years. Definitely within my lifetime if the Lord allows me to live that long. Here's why I say that. I think within the next five years, the church is going to get a little letter that says, Hey, you want to keep your non-profit tax deductible status, here's some things you can no longer speak out against. Chief among those, things like homosexuality, pedophilia. It would be considered a hate speech crime. And so... All of a sudden, we're going to have to decide, do we want to be the New Testament church or government church? I've told a lot of people, you're not just training your kids to be Christians at this point. You've got to train them to be warriors. Because we do not live in one nation under God anymore. We are a divided country. And, and here's the interesting thing. I don't think it has anything to do with red states, blue states, political parties. I think the real division in our nation is that we've got a group of people who still believe in God. They're, they're still somewhat willing to submit themselves to Him. And then on the other side, we've got a group of people who stiffen their necks and they don't want to submit to anybody. There's your division right there. The problem is most Christians today don't realize just how divided we are. You look online and they're actively recruiting our kids. This is from a, a humanistic, atheistic site. Notice they've got games, they've got videos where the children can quote unquote give up their foolish religious beliefs. But they're not just targeting kids, folks. They imagine, if you will, you, you train your child for 18 years, you send them off to college. They're sitting at the feet of a, a man who asked them, a professor who says, I want you to write the word Jesus on a piece of paper, put it on the ground, and then step on it. Actually, it happened at Florida Atlantic University. One young man, he, he decided he didn't want to do that, so the school took disciplinary action against him. Now, folks, I, I say that, Again, what do you think would have happened if that school said, we want you to write the word Mohammed on a piece of paper, put it on the ground and step up? Do you think that would be the same response? No. Or what about Lebanon, Tennessee, where a school system got hit with a $171,000 fine? You know what they did? They were allowing parents to come together and pray for their kids every morning. Now, let me, let me clarify. Let me make sure you understand. These parents were not interacting with the kids. They were not evangelizing the kids. Literally, all they were doing was praying for them. One young man went home, told his atheist dad. Dad gets mad, sues the school system. $171,000 later, that group of praying parents had to disband. Now, 
Just as a side note, if there's one thing our school systems need right now, it's prayer. Or maybe you go to like Dixon County High School where a teacher gave out an assignment. She wanted the kids to write a research paper using four sources. Now, keep in mind, some of the kids wrote about things like witchcraft. Some of them wrote about reincarnation. One young lady by the name of Brittany Settle, she wrote her paper on the life of Jesus Christ, gave the four sources, and yet because of her topic, she received a zero. Because you see, our kids are being told, you can't bring God or the Bible in the classroom. I want you to read a, a quote with me. It's from a guy named Benjamin Rush. He's one of the signers of our Declaration of Independence. Notice what his thoughts are on God, the Bible, and the classroom. He said, the only foundation for a useful education in a republic is to be laid in what? Religion. He says, without this, there can be no virtue. Without virtue, there can be no liberty. Liberty is the object in the life of all Republican governments. He says, without religion, I believe learning does much mischief to the morals and the principles of mankind. He is spot on. I'm fixing to show you why. What I want us to do during this first hour together is I want us to, to basically look at two lessons from history. Because I, I'm one of those guys that thinks if you don't learn from it, what are you going to do? You're going to repeat it. Now, this first history lesson, it is relatively recent. It's within the life of some people in this room. Now, granted, I could go way, way back. I could, I could start my timeline all the way back in 1859 when a, a guy named Charles Darwin wrote his book, right? But I, I don't think there was any of you around at that time, okay? Maybe one of you. <laughs> we could go to, say, 1925. It's Gold's Monkey Trial, Dayton, Tennessee. But again, that's realistically, that's too far back. What I want us to do, I want you to see firsthand what's happened just within your lifetime. So we'll start in about 1950. 1950 is when the government got involved in the topic of origins. They formed the National Science Foundation. Those of you who were living at the time, you may remember, we were racing the Russians to space. 1957, we got beat by Sputnik. They launched a satellite, and all of a sudden there was a massive amount of, of concern. Folks wanted to know, what does this mean? Does, that, does it mean they're going to take over? In fact, take a look at this, this quote. It says, the tide began to turn in the 1960s in part because of the Soviet launch of the Sputnik satellite in 1957. That triumph of Soviet science created a national panic in the state of American science education, including the teaching of evolution. Textbooks began surveying evolution again, and by 1967, even the Tennessee legislature had repealed the law that got Scopes arrested. So, here we are, 1957, lots of pressure to produce scientists. Just two years later, in 1959, the 100th anniversary of Charles Darwin's book, President Eisenhower, his advisors told him, said, look, we, we've got to scrap the way we're teaching origins. We've we got to get rid of God and creation, and we've got to use what these other nations are using because we're falling behind. Anybody ever heard that? So here's what he did. That year he asked Congress for a billion dollars to revamp how we teach origins. Now a billion dollars, that's a whole lot of money. But folks, a billion dollars in 1959, that was an enormous amount of money. And he got it. And I want you to watch the dominoes start falling right after that. That was in 1959. By 1962, Supreme Court outlawed prayer in the classroom. They said it's unconstitutional. The very next year, Madeline Murray O'Hare won her famous lawsuit kicking the Bible reading out of the classroom. So follow me for just a moment. At the same time, we're injecting a godless theory, we're simultaneously pulling out God. In fact, by 1968, 
state of Arkansas was told, you must teach human evolution. You don't have a choice. The very next year, 1969, our nation passed the no-fault divorce law. No-fault divorce, what does that mean? Talk to all the young folks for just a minute, because most of the young people in here don't realize it used to be really hard to get a divorce in America, believe it or not. And in fact, in almost every state of the union, it took a calendar year, and it had to be one of the three A's. Abuse, abandonment, or adultery. When they passed this thing right here, basically it opened the floodgate and said, look, you get a divorce for anything. Somebody burns a toast, you get a divorce. And, and I tell young people, and I'm not really kidding, it is now easier in many states to get out of your marriage than it is to get out of your cell phone contract. <laughs> Think about it. And you say, okay, Brad, why, why would you add this one to that, that whole list? I'll tell you why I add that one. Because, folks, if you want to topple a nation, you don't start in Washington, D.C. You start in the home. And this right here was the beginning it literally undermined the home. You say, all right, I, I hear what you're saying, but what, what does all of this stuff matter? Folks, it matters because what your children think about their origins dictates their behavior. Now, I, I'm going to prove that to you, but the reality is if they think they're just the, the fortunate mistake of countless biochemical morons, they're going to behave differently than if they think they're created in the image and likeness of God. Remember what Abraham Lincoln said? He said the philosophy of the classroom in one generation will be the philosophy, philosophy of the government in the next. Now, the reason that I, I show you that, we've now had two generations go through our school system learning this godless theory. And they're now in D.C. In fact, that sounds an awful lot like Adolf Hitler. Who said, let me control the textbooks and I will control the state. See, he knew, guys, listen to me. He realized that our young people are the ultimate prize. I'm not sure the church realizes that. He knew if he was going to form a, a, a new nation, what he had to do was infect the hearts and the minds of the young people. Which... Probably is why last year Melissa Harris Perry said this. She said kids belong to the community, not their parents. <laughs> well, that's interesting because last time I checked, according to this book, they're my responsibility. So what have been the results of this first history lesson? What, what have we seen during your lifetime? I'm going to use 1963 as kind of my landmark year, and here's why. You remember Eisenhower asked for the money in 1959. It usually takes about four years once you get the money to actually get it into the textbooks. And by 1963, we'd outlawed prayer, and we outlawed Bible reading. Did he get evolution in the textbooks? Oh, yeah, in a huge way. But, folks, here's the reality. That literally was just the beginning because all of a sudden what we started doing was we started reaping other fruits that we weren't prepared for. Like, for instance, percentage of teenage girls having premarital sex has gone up in every age category since 1963. In fact, I want everybody to look at the screen for just a minute. You'll notice there's a, an orange bar right here. I, I put that there on purpose. To represent 1963. Notice before that, we're still teaching that there is a God, that you were created by God. After that, you're just the fortunate mistakes of countless biochemical morons. You're going to see this orange bar in a couple of graphs, so keep in mind that's kind of the dividing line. By the way, as a kind of an offshoot of this one, Sexually transmitted diseases in children. Notice this. Ages 10 to 14 is up 385% since 1963. Or how about this one? Birth rates for unwed girls up 200% since 1963. 
Interesting, pregnancies are actually up 553%. You say, whoa, it's come out, right? Your, your math doesn't jive. How, how could pregnancies be up 553%? Birth rates are only up 200. That would be because in 1973, we legalized abortion. Roe v. Wade. And so now, a, a pregnancy does not automatically equate what? A birth. How about this one? Out of wedlock births, as a percentage of all births, has gone up every single year since 1963. In fact, let me kind of wake you up a little bit this evening. As of December the 31st, 2013, 43% of all children born in the United States are born in this situation right here. 43%. And you look at me and you say, yeah, okay, Brad, we, we all know somebody who maybe fits that category. It's, it's, it's a sad situation, but well, what does it really matter? <laughs> Two things. Number one, God has a plan for the family unit. Amen? Number two, you ever really studied what happens when you take a dad out of the home? Folks, take a look at the screen. 63% of the young people who take their lives, they're coming from homes without a father. 71% of high school dropouts coming from homes without a dad. In fact, 85% of the young people in prison right now, as I'm talking to you, coming from homes without a father. Or how about this one? Unmarried couples living together. Up 725% since 1963. And what right about now some of you are saying, but wait a second, you know, the population has grown, right? And you're right, it has which is why I've got this white line right here at the bottom. That's where we should be if we just go by population growth alone. We're literally off the chart. I I'll be honest, church, we don't even blush over this one anymore. Or what about divorce? Obviously, divorce is up since 1963. You pass the no-fault divorce law, guess what? It's going to go up. And somebody says, wait, time out, Brad, hold up. It, it looks like it's decreasing there at the end of your chart. That, that's great. Okay, well, before you get out the banners and start celebrating, you might want to know the only reason the divorce rate is going down is because our kids aren't getting married. They're shacking up. How about this one? Violent crime. The United States of America is up 995% since 1963. By the way, you notice every single one of these graphs I'm giving you, I'm giving you the source that I got it from. I'm not just plucking numbers out of thin air, okay? Here's the ironic part to me. Most of the places where I'm getting the data, it's actually coming from the same government that is demanding we teach our kids this godless theory. And yet they can't see it. In fact, take a look. This is a quote out of the LA Times. It says, in most of Oakland Unified School District's 92 schools, the fight against crime and violence is unending. An Uzi semi-automatic rifle with 15 hollow point bullets was among the weapons confiscated by district officials within the last year. Franklin Elementary School, trying to ensure the students know to hit the ground when bullets fly, they carry out shooting drills twice a year. Shooting drills. Okay, let, let me point out something to everybody. I'm the product of public schools in the Nashville, Tennessee area, okay? I remember fire drills. Loved them. Because that meant you got to go outside. You know, line up single file, march outside. In Tennessee, we sometimes get tornadoes. So we have tornado drills. You go in the hallway, you cover up, and you hope that it's not coming. In fact, I was born at the very, very end of the Cold War era. And I can remember at least once or twice crawling under a desk for a bomb drill. You remember those? Some of you do. Like that little bitty desk would do anything about a bomb does I don't remember this. How about this one? Suicide in young people up 253% since 1963. In fact, it, it's gone from the 12th leading cause of death. It's now the third. But, but again, you shouldn't be surprised. Because, folks, if you take away God, you're taking away their hope. 
In fact, take a look at this one. Child abuse up 2,300% since 1963. Again, not surprised. You tell people they're animals, guess what they're going to act like? Illegal drugs up 6,000% since 1963. And in fact, let me share with, with all of you what our real report card is. This is what the mainstream media refuses to talk about. And that is, since we have removed God from the classroom, take a look. The United States has become the world leader in violent crime, divorce rate, teenage pregnancy, illegal drug use, and notice this, we got the highest illiteracy rate of any industrial nation. By the way, that's not my opinion. That's the facts. In fact, let me show you a graph going the other way. That would be our SAT scores. Going down. Right about down, there's somebody in about the 30s or 40s looking at it going, wait, wait, it came up and I told you, hey, again, before you get excited, those little bumps you see right there at the end, those are what we call calibrations. You, you know what a calibration is? It's where we make the test easier. And even that's not working. It, let, me, let me see if I can break it down for you this way. Let's say that we go back in time to about 1960. Some of you were around then, some of you were in school. Let's say we walk down the hallway of a school, we, we, we stick our head into a classroom, and we simply ask a teacher one question. What's your biggest complaint? Well, what's your biggest problem? They actually did this. You can find the survey online. Notice the top two answers. Talking and chewing gum. Now, as you look at that list, here's what I want you to do. I want you to mentally come back to the present thinking about going down the local high school here. And let's say we, we tried the same thing. First thing you've got to realize is you don't get to walk into high schools anymore like that, do you? No. No. In fact, you've got to get a visitor pass. You may have to go through the metal detector. But let's say you get in. So you, you stick your head into a classroom. And you ask the teacher that same question. What's your biggest problem? What, what is your biggest complaint? Is there anybody in this room that think talking and chewing gum will be the top two answers? No. They, they've done this survey several times. You'll notice this particular year what the answers were. They changed a little bit, haven't they? And folks, listen to me. Please don't miss this point. You take a 15-year-old child from today and a 15-year-old child from 1960, anatomically speaking, they're exactly the same, right? I mean, both 15-year-old kids. So what's changed? How is it we've gone from talking and chewing gum being our biggest problem to all kinds of crime, drug use? I'm telling you, it's what we're putting in right up here. It's our attitude toward God. In fact, I, I think the reason that our nation is in the condition it's in right now it is basically we've abandoned our moral compass. It's kind of hard to find true north on a moral compass if you get rid of God. Psalm chapter 14, verse 1, the Bible says this, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. By the way, if we're totally honest, what he's talking about right there are atheists. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. What, what about the second history lesson? I told you guys that we're going to look at two history lessons. The second one, we're going to go a little further back in time. In fact, if you brought a Bible with you tonight, open it up to the book of Deuteronomy. Book of Deuteronomy, you remember, is basically a, a series of sermons that Moses is giving that second generation of Israelites right before they get to go in the land of milk and honey. Notice the warning that he gives them in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Starting in verse 11, he says, Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, his statutes, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, 
When your herds and your flocks multiply, your silver and your gold are multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, and your heart is lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God. Let, let me just ask you the question. Is it possible that in America we built goodly houses? And that our silver and our gold have multiplied, our flocks have multiplied, and somewhere along the way we've forgotten God. Do you remember what happened to them? Let, let me give you the, the very quick, what we used to call Cliff Notes version. In the book of Deuteronomy, Moses dies, right? Leadership is handed over to a guy named Joshua. Joshua is going to be the guy that carries them across the Jordan into the promised land. In fact, in, in Joshua chapter 4... Or David. Solomon. Remember who came after Solomon? It was his son, Rehoboam. And if you write in your Bible, you might circle his name because it was under Rehoboam that those 12 tribes actually split into a divided kingdom. Ten of them went north. They formed Israel. They had 19 kings in succession, every single one of which was evil. You, you can turn in your Bible, 1 and 2 Kings, you can read about these men. In fact, they were so bad that God sent men like Elijah, Isaiah, to, to try to call them back. And yet, most of you in here, you know their faith, roughly 722 B.C., God said, I'm done with you. And he gave them over to the Assyrians. All right. What about the other two twelve tribes? Remember, Benjamin and Judah made up the nation of Judah. They also had 19 kings, most of which we would call evil. Now, they did have a, a couple of good guys in there. They, they had been like, for instance, Josiah, who, you remember, he, he finds the book of the law, he tears his clothes, he reads it in front of the people. But here's the thing. As you're reading through First and Second Kings, you keep running across this one phrase. It says they didn't tear down the high places. They just allowed all kind of pagan worship. And, and so again, what did God do? He sent prophets. He sent men like Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel to try to call them back. 606 B.C. They were given over to the Babylonians. And you say, hey, okay, Brad, what's the big deal? What, what, what's this history lesson? We'll take a look. It took roughly 213 years for God's chosen people in His chosen land of Israel to be given over to the Assyrians. It took 349 for Judah. I think the reason why they lasted longer, they did have some good leaders in there. But as you look at those two time periods, the one question that I want running through right up here in the front of your forehead is this. How old is the United States of America? I'll give you a hint. We declared our independence in 1776. We fall literally right between those two periods. So maybe now the next question is, all right, what determines the course of a nation? Well, let's see, we could go home this evening. We could turn on the evening news and, and they would tell us all about things like the stock market or maybe Social Security or Obamacare or, or Middle East, what's going on, or the economy or, or, or the military. Here's the interesting thing. 
if Jesus Christ comes back tomorrow, how many of those little sound bites on the screen actually matter? None of them. Now I'm really fixing to make some enemies. Not even Social Security. <laughs> Folks, if you want to know what determines the course of a nation, the Bible tells you. It's our reverence and obedience to God. That's it. I mean, think about it for just a minute. How many times have you heard people quoting the verse, Righteousness exalts a nation. Righteousness exalts a nation. Think about that. Now, as you think about that, think about this. Right now, we have legalized same-sex marriage in 18 states. Abortion has been legal basically my entire life. We produce 82% of the pornography consumed by the world. We got more immorality on primetime television right now than we've ever had in the world. Righteousness exalts a nation. Thinking about that, then we've got to ask the question, all right, what actually happened to Israel and Judah? Let, let's catch back up to them for just a moment. 2 Kings chapter 17, starting in verse 13. The Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all of his prophets, every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways. Keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. Nevertheless, they would not hear, but they stiffened their necks like the necks of their fathers, notice this, who did not believe in the Lord their God. They had atheists back then who were converting the next generation. What, what, what were they doing? Well, if you read through the Bible, you notice they were committing things like idolatry. Here's the funny thing. When I say that word, most of us, we kind of go, okay, good. I don't have any little statues of Buddha on my mantle. Question, are there other forms of idolatry? Like, did Paul mention in Colossians 3, 5 that covetousness is idolatry? Oh, we don't have that problem in America, do we? <laughs> Keeping up with, uh, yeah, y'all can figure it out. What about adultery? It, it blows my mind how many parents will allow their children to watch TV shows that glamorize adultery, and then they're surprised when their kid comes home at age 26 with a broken marriage. They didn't tear down the high places. They didn't even on the silo. They were actually offering up their children to the fires of Mole. They were using mediums. And so what happened? Take a look. 2 Kings 23 verse 26. Nevertheless, the Lord did not turn from the fierceness of his great wrath with which his anger was roused against Judah. In other words, God got mad. Ooh, we, don't like to talk. we don't talk about that very much, do we? You know, if you were to go from coast to coast in America and ask people to describe God, you don't ever get this. That's not one of the characteristics we mention. We, we talk about His love and, and grace. But in a full portrait, the Bible uses words like a jealous God, a holy God. In fact, take a look. One of those kings named Manasseh said he did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to what? Anger. 2 Kings chapter 24, verse 20. For because of the anger of the Lord, this happened in Jerusalem and Judah, that he finally cast them out of his presence. Okay, here's a question for you to chew on tonight when you go home. Is it possible that the Lord's going to do the same thing with us? I actually had a Christian one time come up to me very arrogantly say, I don't think there's any way you would take us down because we were we started as a Christian nation. I said, okay, wait a second. These were God's chosen people in his chosen land. And yet he still rebuked them, didn't he? Why? Wow. Take a look. 2 Chronicles 28, verse 19. The Lord brought Judah up. Because of Ahaz, the king of Israel, notice this, for he encouraged what? Moral decline. Now, surely in the United States of America, we're not encouraging moral decline, right? I mean, 
Surely we would not be having middle school girls who are being forced to ask their classmates for a lesbian kiss. Surely we wouldn't do that, right? Yeah, actually we did. It was actually under an anti-bully campaign. Surely in the United States of America, we wouldn't be promoting gender-neutral bathrooms, right? Yeah, actually we are. Colorado was one of the first states that actually signed on to it. It is on the law books. I've double-checked, been there a couple of times. Governor signed it into law. In Colorado, if you build a new public facility, by law, you must have gender-neutral bathrooms. That would be bathrooms that men and women use at the same time. And it turns out Colorado is one of the leading states for transgender surgery. They petitioned the court. They said, hey, we don't know where to go. The court said, you're absolutely right. That's discrimination. We'll just make them all gender neutral. Now, let's say that you look at that and realize, that's not good. I wouldn't do it. Well, folks, there's a $5,000 fine and up to a year in prison for everybody that doesn't follow this. You say, Brad, man, they can't do it. We live in the United States of America. Folks, we're already doing it. They're already desensitizing our kids. State of Maine, just up the road, so to speak. They've got gender-neutral locker rooms. <laughs> California actually paved the way. They actually, several of their school districts, they took down the little boys and little girls sign. And so now, boys and girls use the same facility at the same time. Now you ask the obvious question, what are you thinking? They give two answers. Number one, they say they don't want any child to have an advantage over another child. Number two, they say they don't want to force a gender identity onto any of those kids before they're ready. Now, I know this is going to surprise everybody in this room, okay? But when I was born, my parents knew my gender. And it hadn't changed. By the way, this will be the same state that is trying to submit a law that would make pedophilia not a crime, but rather a sexual orientation. Which means they would be allowed then to teach your children, to drive the bus, to work at the daycare. The Lord brought Judah low because they encouraged moral decline. Surely in the United States of America, we're not offering birth control to first graders, right? I mean, surely we haven't reached that point. Oh, yes, yeah, next door in Massachusetts. Oh, surely we wouldn't, like, uh, allow the morning after pill to children under 15. I mean, surely we're teaching them purity, right? No, we're not. In fact... Gone are the days of kids learning about Spot, Jane. Now there are little books called A is for Activist. I mean, surely in the United States of America, we're not wanting to add more profanity to TV, right? Yeah, they are. Or surely we're not producing books for kids ages 4 to 8 that's, that's teaching them about transgenderism. I mean, I was still playing with cars and Legos, folks. And you say, whew, look at my grandchild's not that old yet. Oh, that's all right. They got them covered. They got books that go down all the way to one, folks. This is Felicia's favorite story. A, a story about two lesbian women who adopt a little girl, teach her their lifestyle. Or how about a toddler book? Oh, the things mommies do. What could be better than having two? In fact, let me just wake everybody up. There have been nine books mailed free of charge to every public elementary school in the United States of America. I own seven of these. In fact, let, let me do this. I, I'm going to show you a couple of pages out of this one right here. It's called Daddy's Roommate. Now, understand, I'm not showing you the whole book, okay? Quite literally, can't really stomach it. But I, I want you to imagine for a minute... Your child, your grandchild going down, having library time. Library starts to read, my mommy and daddy got a divorce last year. Now there's somebody new at daddy's house. 
Daddy and his roommate Frank live together. Sleep together. Mommy says Daddy and Frank are gay. First I didn't know what that meant, so she explained it. Being gay is just one more kind of love. And love is the best kind of happiness. Daddy and his roommate are very happy together. And I'm happy too. Folks, that's wicked. To plant that in the heart of the mind of a child. The Lord brought Judah low because they encouraged more to plant. Surely we don't have a college that's offering a collegiate minor in queer studies. Yeah, we do. Surely we don't have a, a website that is targeting married people to commit adultery. And surely if we do, we don't have millions of people signed up. In fact, just to see how bad it is, take a look. This is a billboard. Used to say, Thou shalt not commit adultery. They crossed out the not. See, when you take God out of a community or a society, you have no foundation. And that's where we are today. In fact, before I let you guys take a, a, a break, let me share with you in a single slide kind of what the overall problem really is. I, I made this one just to kind of show you what's going on. You've got heaven up here in the top right corner, man in the lower left. Hopefully everybody in this room wants to get to heaven. If you don't want to get to heaven, come see me in, during the break, okay? I want to talk to you. And I realize I don't have every single step on here, but just kind of follow me for a minute. Obviously, if you're going to get to heaven, you've got to believe in a God, right? But not just that, you also have to understand that we're created by God and that you are actually here for a purpose. And not just that, that you're made in his image and therefore you have a soul that's going to live on after death. And not just that, that you were created with free will, that God loved you so much that you were created with free will and therefore you have to obey the gospel. But not just that, you realize there really is an Adam. There really was a fall and therefore the need for a redeemer named Jesus Christ. And at death, death the soul is gone. Now, uh, admittedly, that's not every single step, but you kind of get the picture, right? Okay, here's what I want you to do. And I want you to chew on this when we go to break. Let's go all the way back to the beginning through the eyes of your child or grandchild or their textbooks. That, that first step, <laughs> we've we got to get rid of that because God's not allowed in the textbooks, right? So we've got we to get rid of that. As far as being created by God, they would say no man evolved. So we've got to get rid of that step as well. Being made in the image of God, they'd say, look, there, there is nothing supernatural. There is no soul. You, you're just an animal. There's only nature. So we've got to get rid of that step as well. As far as having free will and obeying, they would say, look, there's nobody out there to obey. Eat, drink, and be merry. When it comes to Adam, they would say there was no Adam. In fact, they would say there's no absolute right or wrong, period. Death, they would say death's the end. And, and so instead of pointing our children Towards heaven, what our kids are getting actually is a very gloomy picture that's pointing them in the wrong direction. What's the solution? Take a look. We've got to have active Christians. Okay, that first word, we haven't done that very well in the last 25 years. We've been really good at sitting in a pew. Christians who are willing to humble themselves, notice this, engage two groups. Number one, you've got to go back and engage your family. And number two, we've got to engage the culture. The Bible puts it this way, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people who are called by my name, who are his people today? We are. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin. Out here in the land. That's good news. But it requires us to do something. In fact, Acts chapter 10, verse 34, Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and 
works righteousness is accepted by him. We got to understand there really is a battle going on. And the ultimate prize of that battle is the hearts and the souls of our kids. My question to you as we go to break is, how hard are you willing to fight? Because they're fighting hard. Appreciate y'all's attention thus far. We're going to take about a 12 minute break or so. Some of y'all got too sugared up last night. There are snacks in the back, drinks in the back. Look forward to seeing you here this morning.